Eh, saludos. Eh, my name is Manuel Frau Ramos, uh, member of the board of director of the Holyoke Public Library, and founder of the Puerto Rican Culture Project, a group associated to the library. Today, we begin a lecture series titled Perspective of Puerto Rican Diaspora, sponsored by the Holyoke History Room, headed by Eileen Crosby. The lecture series was made possible by a grant of mass humanities with the funding from the Mass Council, Cultural Council. Before introducing today's speaker, I would like to invite you to the next uh, event. The first one, sponsored by the Holy History Room. The next one is October 20th, titled Housing and Puerto Rican in New York City, 1945-1920, by Professor Vanessa Rosa from Manholio College. The last one is October 29th, about American citizenship, status for Puerto Rican, can Congress treat the citizenship of Puerto Rican away if Puerto Rico changed status by Professor Charles Benator Santiago from University of Connecticut. Uh, also, I am very happy to have uh, the, spe the speaker today because we have a long relationship with the Gaston Institute. Oh, I'm sorry, there is another one. In October 14, 15, 16, October, the, there is a conference of Puerto Rican Study Association at Holy Community College. <coughs> if you want more information about that conference, go to www.ricanstudies.com. And also, October 13, at 6 o'clock, right here, we are hosting Jamira Bonilla, acting director of the Center for Rica Studies <coughs> Center at Hunter College, where we are signing a collaboration agreement between the Holy Public Library and the Centro. Now, uh, before I introduce the speaker, let's go back to the framework of this conference in 1991. Sonia Nieto and I did a research title. I was an outsider, dropping Puerto Rican youth in Holyoke, Massachusetts. That, that study was supported by the Gaston Institute um, three years later, we are going to hear Dr. Rivera talking about no dropouts, about ingredients for a student success. And the last one note that I want to mention is that in 1992, Sonia Nieto and I organized the first Puerto Rican oriented conference in Western Massachusetts, called Symposium on Puerto Rican Migration and Education, that was a multi institutional collaboration between UMass Amherst, UMass Boston, Gaston Institute, Council of Education, and University of Puerto Rico main campus. One of the students, the other student that attended to that conference was Lorna Rivera. Today, director of the Gaston Institute. We are planning to repeat that conference next year that basically is centered in Puerto Rican migration and education. Now we are introducing Dr. Alona Rivera, director of Mauricio Gaston Institute for Latino Community Development and Public Policy mejor conocido como Gaston Institute, Associate Professor of Women's and Gender Study and Latino Study at UMass Boston. Now, our speaker, Dr. Lorna Rivera. Thank you. 
Um, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Um, thanks so much for coming out on a Saturday afternoon. I uh, really appreciate it. Gracias a todos por, por venir hoy. Um, me lo agradezco mucho que están aquí conmigo en un sábado. Um, but I'm going to do the presentation in, in English. Um, uh, so thank you again for, for being here. I want to also thank um, Dr. Eileen Crosby. Uh, I want to really give um, my, my deepest thanks uh, to Manuel Frau Ramos as well. Um, and thank you all for, for coming again and also the Holy Oak History Room uh, for today's um, invitation, where, as um, Manuel said, you know, there's, there's a lot of bad news um, in terms of some of the outcomes, but I want to begin with some of that, you know, data and some research, but really shift the focus uh, primarily on, like, what are, what are the ingredients for success? What do we know really works um, in, the, in, in supporting the educational success of Puerto Rican students? And I would argue that this works for all students, too, uh, what, what works for Puerto Rican students. Um, I did want to um, also say that it is a pleasure as well to be you know, part of this um, Perspectives on the Puerto Rican Diaspora, this uh, special uh, lecture series. And again, want to thank Mass Humanities Council, uh, the, the Massachusetts Cultural Council, and Mass Humanities um, for, for supporting this, this important work um, and highlighting, again, the important contributions of Puerto Rican uh, in the United States. Um, but before I begin, I did um, want to get a sense of, you know, who's in the room um, and, and maybe even in the virtual space, I, I can see some hands. Um, but if you could just, um, you know, raise your hand um, if you identify as Puerto Rican. Okay. Um, raise your hand if you have ever been to Puerto Rico. Okay. Um, raise your hand if you know a Puerto Rican student. Okay, that's everybody. Awesome. Um, do you know a Puerto Rican teacher or principal? Raise your hand. Okay, great. Um, raise your hand if you speak un poquito, a little Spanish, or a lot of Spanish. Okay, great. <laughs> and raise your hand if you live or work in Holyoke. Okay, the majority of folks, great. So thank you. I just, I wanted to get a little sense of, of who's in the room um, so that I can also just, you know, tailor my remarks accordingly. Um, but I will, you know, again, um, looking forward to hearing from you all from your perspectives, knowing Puerto Rican students, you know, having been to Puerto Rico, some of you, and living and working in Holyoke. I'd love to, again, hear your, your um, you know, contributions during the discussion. Um, so for today's presentation, as I mentioned, I'm going to um, share some of the findings from uh, some of our research at the Gaston Institute. And I just wanted to um, just say a little bit about the Gaston Institute because um, it is, um, it was founded by Latino community activists that um, rallied with the State House um, to get the, the state legislature to create um, a research institute to study the growing Latinx community in Massachusetts. Um, it was founded in 1989. At that time, you know, most of the population in our state were Puerto Ricans and Dominicans and, and Cubans. Um, but we saw a large influx, right, of Central Americans uh, coming into Massachusetts. And so the center, um, the institute really uh, began to really provide, um, you know, research briefs um, and partner Partnerships with community-based organizations, and it continues to this to today uh, to be an independent institute at the University of Massachusetts Boston, and serving all of Massachusetts. So we have done a lot of work in the Holyoke and Springfield and, and throughout the state um, with our communities. Um, if um, you're interested in, say, any of the research reports that I referenced today, um, you can visit our website and you'll see that by year you'll have, you know, you can do searches and see where uh, some of our reports uh, can be found on our website. Um, we do have a 2022 report on Latinos in Holyoke that I'll be drawing from, and also a report that we did on Puerto Ricans in Massachusetts, but also, again, Holyoke being a big part of that, that report as well. 
Um, before I get started, though, you know, uh, as I talk about this research, you know, and Manuel mentioning that I was a student at the conference um, in the first conference on Puerto Ricans in education, um, you know, I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself um, and start with the pictures of some of my, my family here um, because I also. Um, you know, had a journey here. Um, in the left hand there is, um, well, to my left, I'm like, to your right, is my, my parents. Um, I was there in my mother's belly, pregnant. Um, and so, but I was born in Chicago, in the Humboldt Park neighborhood of Chicago. Um, this is me and my grandmother. And then this is me in Calle, Puerto Rico, which is where all of my family on my father's side continues to live. And, um, you know, just Hurricane um, Fiona was hit, Calle pretty bad, um, but um, it is a beautiful part of Puerto Rico. Um, I came to Boston then um, to really um, get my, my education at, at Northeastern University. Um, but my, so my family is from Puerto Rico, born in Chicago, but really I went back and forth a lot uh, to Puerto Rico when I was a kid because some of us might remember Eastern Airlines was the major airline and children could fly for free, believe it or not, children could fly for free at a time. And so what would happen was literally as soon as school vacation was over or any, you know, breaks on the, on, you know, to Puerto Rico, you know, to go, they would put, fill the airplanes literally with children. Um, it was amazing. And I would spend my summers then in Puerto Rico in a place where in Calle at the time there was like no indoor plumbing. We had an outhouse. There was no street lights, no paved roads. It was really a very rural part of Puerto Rico. And growing up in Chicago, right, and going there to the country, right, was just and like, I, you know, amazing for me. But also that's why I was able to maintain some of my Spanish and some of my, my culture. Um, and so it really just, um, again, um, had those relationships going back and forth from the islands. Um, I am the first person in my family to, to go to college. Um, I be wanted to become a teacher because really being uh, in, you know, growing up in in Humble Park and in Logan Square, Chicago, if, if you know, back in those days in the 1970s, um, it was a rough area, um, and many of my relatives did get involved, um, and particularly my sister, in gangs and and the violence um, in my neighborhood um, was was really bad. And so, going to to school was my safe place. And I know that for many Puerto Rican students, like that story is their story today as well for my students that are Puerto Rican as well. Um, and that was my, my experience of, you know, being um, the finding, you know, safety in school. And that's why I wanted to become a teacher. Um, I also came to, um, again, understand that there were really low expectations of me um, as a student, um, as well as, you know, many of my relatives. Um, and so for me, I wasn't expected to go to college. I was already working f like almost full time when I was in high school. Um, so it was really a journey to, to get there. Um, and it was really my friends um, that helped me get to DePaul University. And by getting there, this is another piece of an ingredient of success, is having mentors and other Puerto Rican role models. And so I was so fortunate that um, Dr. Felix Padilla, who is one of the founders of Latino Studies, um, was writing a book called Puerto Rican Chicago, and the book The Gang is an American Enterprise. And my sister and her boyfriend, who was a leader of a gang, were, were like his informants for that, for that book. And he came to our house one day um, to find my sister and I you know I answered the door and I'm like who is you know who's this guy and he was a professor at DePaul University where I was a freshman and so he really took me under his wing as a mentor um, and so I started working as a work-study student at a center like 
the Gaston Institute called the Center for Latino Research. And that was where, you know, again, I, I really was able to succeed even as a college student, not having the right skills, because I was a Chicago Public Schools <laughs> all my life graduate, and, and I still found, right, that family and that support, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, so that's really why I became a teacher. The other important picture I wanted to point out here, which is another aspect of, I think, you know, the success ingredients, is giving back to your community. And what happened at UMass Boston was they also had a chapter of a national program called the Latino Leadership Opportunity Program. And that was started by the Ford Foundation in the 1980s to increase the numbers of Latinos that would go on to become professors and scholars and researchers. Um, and so UMass Boston's Gaston Institute had an LLOP program. And so I was an LLOP when I was an undergrad. And so finding that again, it was like, oh my God, is it my destiny? <laughs> like that I'm, you know, here now leading an institute that had such an impact on my own, you know, journey um, and to be able to mentor other students. So that's one of the first, that is the first cohort of the LLOP, one of them up in the right hand corner now. Number of those folks are professors. Uh, this is the Gaston's uh, cohort. Um, I do lead a lot of students and I do my own research in Puerto Rico, in Vieques, Puerto Rico, on environmental health assessments. Um, and that's a picture over here left um, with Robert, Roberto Rabin, who was a, a very big activist. Um, for you know, um, getting the Navy out of Vieques um, with this, and that's another story. I can come back and talk about Vieques some other time. But uh, I want to show like that I bring students, like Puerto Rican students that have never been to Puerto Rico, and that's really transformative too to go back and like really learn both the island's history, but also our contributions here. Um, and then here's a picture of me um, with my son. I just had to put my son in the picture um, when um, I was working with Marty. Mayor Marty Walsh on the school committee in Boston, and this is what um, basically they had a little room for my um, swearing in that was really small. And I don't know, Melissa Colon or some people put out on Facebook, and literally, like, I don't know where all these Puerto Ricans came from, but Puerto Ricans filled up like City Hall that day, and it was just like so amazing. Uh, so I wanted to share that as part of my journey too, and why I'm committed to to doing this work at both myself being a student, a teacher, and now a researcher. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit again about the success ingredients, right, And but also like how I approach the work that I do in terms of thinking about what are these social contexts or what we call, you know, in the public health field, the social determinants of health, that really it's all of these things, right, all these contexts that really make a difference, right, on our well-being, on our physical health, but uh, our mental health as well. So understanding these social determinants of health is also how I approach, you know, looking at student success. Um, so not just what happens, right, in schools. And I'll go back to that theme um, in my talk. Um, I did want to mention that some of the data I'll share today, um, there is um, a new report that we did that was funded by the Latino Equity Fund, which is part of the Boston Foundation, that is um, looking at these persistent economic challenges and opportunities facing Latinos in Massachusetts. And there are some pieces of Holyoke in that report as well, um, but it's, I would, again, highly recommend uh, looking at, at that report as a recent one. And there is a video uh, available on the Boston Foundation's website that discusses the, 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 those kind, the data uh, statewide. Um, but we know then that basically in Massachusetts, I'll start with Massachusetts here and then bring it right down to Holyoke, um, is that what's different about Massachusetts, and I know when I came here in 1991 from Chicago, uh, I was like, where are the Mexicans? <laughs> um, and that's been, uh, that's a big issue, right? Is it like actually an asset really in our state is the diversity of the Massachusetts population. Like compared to other parts of the United States, you don't have this, this kind of diversity. And um, what's important though is again, that Puerto Ricans are, are still the, the largest group um, and that, you know, our state's population, um, 
also in certain cities, right, you'll see more groups represented than others, right? And like in Holyoke with Puerto Ricans being the majority here. Um, and that's, this is a, a slide showing, which isn't a surprise to many of the folks here. Oh yes, please, Anna, ask questions too. Uh -huh. When you, um, that chart that says native born, how have you defined that? Does that mean native born here or native born in, in their country? Well, court, because this is from the, from the census, okay. like all Puerto Ricans are considered native born because they're U.S. citizens. All right. Okay. So that would be the difference there. So See how there's no zero foreign born for right. Puerto Ricans? Even, so they don't, they don't distinguish between island or, or stateside. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Okay, yes. and please do feel free to ask questions throughout, okay? Um, so, so yes, yeah, so looking at then the population of, of Holyoke White, we know that um, the Latino share is much higher than, than the state overall, um, and that, you know, again, the majority are of, um, there's like we're 20,000 um, Puerto Ricans in Holyoke. Um, and it's not just Puerto Ricans, though. There's, there's a few Dominicans here on 681 um, and other groups. But you'll see, again, it's like there's not much of a Central American uh, presence um, in Holyoke. So when I'm going to show you then the data, like some of this, the, the, the data about um, students in Holyoke Public Schools, the American Community Survey just estimates that they're, they're, they're Puerto Ricans, because that's the majority, okay? But you'll see in some of the slides, Latino students, but this is Holyoke. So when you think Latino students in Holyoke, we're talking Puerto Ricans, even though it, it, the, you know, the census doesn't uh, go to that level of detail in this data. Um, <clears throat> And then here, uh, looking at this data here, um, just again showing that, going back to like the social determinants of health, like again, economic stability is critical, right? And so what we know is that the median household income for the Puerto Ricans, right, look at 26,000, right, compared to for the white populations, right, it's almost half, right? Um, so, and compared to the rest of the state, right, Holyoke um, is, you know, one of the um, most um, economically depressed of the cities, right, of the gateway cities in particular. Uh, so the household incomes, again, um, show high rates of poverty, right, and low median income. And then we also have um, high rates of also um, occupational um, segregation, right? So what you, whoops, let me go back here and do my pointer. Um, so if you look at the Latino here, right, most Latinos are working in the service industry in Holyoke, right? Look at that amount right there. Okay, now for, for the black community, it's, it's also a problem. I mean, there's a lot of commonalities there in terms of some of the educational gaps and some of these uh, social economic indicators for the black community in Holyoke as well. Um, Want to also just uh, point out another factor when we think about the social determinants of health is this issue about um, home ownership, right? Because as we know, um, in you know, in places like, um, especially like in the Boston area where there's such high rents, right, that this lack of affordable housing is, is a critical issue. And I know that's an issue here in Holyoke as well. But look at these rates. I mean, nationally, Latinos in Massachusetts nationally have the lowest home ownership rates of any state. Okay, and so that Avancemos YA report is nice because it does like national comparisons. But if we even look statewide here, like this is the lowest. 17% only of Latinos in Holyoke are homeowners. Why is home ownership important? Because again, this is generational wealth. Right? And so, so we need to think about those, those issues as well, of also with housing stability, because when we look at the data on Holyoke students, they move a lot. Like they change schools a lot, and that's like a predictor, right, for leading to dropout. Like, like that engagement in schools, absentee rates, you know, those kinds of things really matter. 
Um, so next I want to turn to, I want to say right up front that I am not um, a historian or an expert by any means on Holyoke, okay? I, there's, there's experts here, right? Um, and this space, right, is the Archives and the Historical Commission. But there's some really, um, there's a pretty, um, a short video I've used even with my students on the history of, um, you know, of Puerto Ricans in Holyoke. Um, it's available on YouTube and I can share these slides with folks who would like them later. Um, but there's a long tradition, right, of Puerto Ricans in, in Holyoke and that social and community context matters. Um, Again, not that I'm a historian, but just a quick little uh, sound, like sound bites on this is that we know that you know Latino migration, especially to the Northeast, like was really high around the turn of the 20th century, and there were you know a lot of these geopolitical events that transpired in the Caribbean that led uh, to the the migration. Um, there was the Spanish-American War in 1898 that set the stage for the migration um, when the United States took control of Puerto Rico and Cuba and then later intervened in the Dominican Republic. Um, but as you know, well, hopefully no Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens who can move freely to and from the U.S. mainland because of the Jones Act, which interestingly, right, is because of Hurricane Maria and even recently, um, you know, there was a waiver given to the Jones Act um, just um, last week. So there's, there's some changing policies that may happen, um, but but Puerto Rico does remain in this colonial relationship um, with the United States um, and has had that since 1898. Um, but in this region, right, you know, this used to be manufacturing industries here, um, and many Puerto Rican seasonal workers, they came, you know, to do agricultural work in like places like Southbridge and, and areas here doing agricultural, seasonal agricultural workers um, came to this area. Um, and then many Puerto Ricans, um, these early migrants, also came because of um, a policy called Operation Bootstrap, right? And that's how my family, from my mother's side, came to the United States and to areas of Chicago, New York, um, were given one-way tickets um, to, to come here um, with, in collaboration right, with some of the, the manufacturing uh, plants that were here. Um, and this was a way to control the population density, supposedly. But there was a lot of you know, transformation happening in Puerto Rico, industrialization, um, and that's how how many Puerto Ricans ended up here through these recording in progress <laughs> okay I didn't do anything today um, so this you know they, they came again through intentional policies right that brought them to um, this area so there's some theories too about like how a lot of um, for Holyoke this area that there are a lot were Puerto Ricans that went to New York and then recording came here shot. Um, where there were, um, you know, the life, the, the quality of life was better here. Um, and so many Puerto Ricans first came through, through New York and then came to, to Holyoke. And so that's another um, interesting connections there with, with that, like, again, the migration that, that continues to happen. Um, so I was really happy to hear when you said that the Holyoke Public Library is going to have a partnership with El Centro. That's amazing um, because you know there's a lot of resources that you can find for teaching about Puerto Ricans as well for any of these educators here perhaps um, that really just again show this whole um, history. There's these amazing poster projects and curriculum materials um, that I highly recommend. Um, and I'm just showing you a little bit of some of the material here because Again, part of what we, we're trying to do in terms of the ingredients of success for, for Latino students, Puerto Rican students, is ethnic studies, right? And Holyoke has been doing this work um, as well and other partners like the Care Center where, you know, really learning about those roots is a key ingredient, right, for advancing student success. I mean, even early research by um, who is our, our new chancellor now at UMass Boston, Marcelo Suarez Orozco, 
Orozco and his partner, um, Carola Suarez Orozco, um, wrote back in the, in the 2000s, did all these studies with immigrants, immigrant students over generations. And what they found was that um, Latino students' self-esteem diminished the longer they were in U.S. schools. Um, and that this contributed to their depressed outcomes. There's a similar paradox in public health called the Hispanic paradox, uh, where how is it that recent immigrants um, have better health, health outcomes than second and, th and, and third generations? And, and again, there's ideas there of like how close you are to your culture. You may be eating, for example, like fresh foods and not prepared foods, but it's also institute, like in, in terms internalized, you know, oppression and racism, institutional racism, how all of that sort of wears down, right, over the generations. Um, and so this is why I think, you know, again, looking at like this cultural wealth, teaching our students is about their histories, their cultures, that this does lead to um, a better econ academic success. And I'll show you at the end a study about that. Um, so also what's happening um, is that Puerto Ricans are also sustaining their culture, right? So there's now um, these kinds of after-school programs that are teaching Taino um, culture, Taino identities, um, and you know, a lot more folks, you know, also really looking at, you know, Puerto Ricans as multiracial. Um, and more, you know, also identifying with their Afro Boricua roots. Um, and so that's another piece that um, in the education that we're seeing a lot more attention to, to this um, part of our, our history. Um, so I did want to also note that in, you know, again, Puerto Ricans, not just in Holyoke, have like a big giant parade, right? You know, like this is a big part of affirming and sustaining our cultural through the expression, through the arts especially. Um, and, you know, we've seen with what happened with, you know, the, the movement in Puerto Rico, right? With, with Ricky Renuncia, with um, what happened with Hurricane Maria and the numbers, right? You see the coffin there. Like we know that those numbers were much higher. And so there's been this consciousness raising, and a lot of it is really being led by musicians, right, and sort of the younger generation. Um, so there's, there's again, a lot of, um, you know, I, I'm really proud that there's this strength, right, and what we are also calling um, diaspora Ricans. Right? So that recognition, right, that like there's actually more Puerto Ricans in numbers, right, stateside now. And what does that mean, right, for Puerto Rican identity and, and what, you know, how do we, um, you know, again, how do we uh, mobilize, right, right that, that, those, um, that cultural expression through political and educational activism? So, Glad that Manuel mentioned this because uh, one of the things too is that I want to give acknowledgement that one of the first like studies written up was this, this chapter in this book that was published by the Gaston Institute and UMass Press, 1993. Um, and, you know, again, some of the, odd, like, the writers in there are, are still doing amazing work. Like Antonia Darder, for example, had a chapter in here. And I'm actually working on an updated version of this book. Manuel's going to have a chapter in there as well. Um, and hoping that maybe, depending on how far along we get, that there might be some um, work with this conference too around updating like what are we doing around the Lat Latino students in Massachusetts. Um, I did want to also note, before I get into more of the data, that there is an archives, right? And Dr. Sonia Nieto's in particular um, has incredible resources at El Centro's library where you can look at, again, um, where they set up the first bilingual centers, where there were um, the first schools, the Holyoke um, immersion, like all of this work, this is an incredible archives. And you can, again, you know, it's not all of it is digitized, so you have to go to, to New York uh, to, to do some research here. But again, want to just acknowledge the amazing contributions of Dr. Sonia Nieto um, in, in advancing our understanding of Puerto Rican students. Okay, 
So I'm going to turn now a little bit to some of the, the data, the bad news, and then we'll look at the good, the good things we can do. Um, <clears throat> so as you know, um, in terms of the educational attainment, the bottom line here for, for Latinos in, Massachusetts, in, in Holyoke schools is that, um, again, they have the, the least, the lowest educational attainment the least likely to have um, even high school diplomas, right? This is less than high school, 36%. And this is only for Holyoke. And again, remember, Latino we're talking is, most, is gonna be Puerto Rican here. Um, but Holyoke is the 40th, 40th largest public school district uh, in Massachusetts. Um, and a great majority, over 82%, are defined as low income. And also, this is interesting because a lot of people think, well, Puerto Ricans have been here generations, they're not English learners. But we have had, right, because of the displacement in Puerto Rico, right, we do have a lot of Puerto Rican students from, from the island here now, right? And so that issue of English learners is, continues to be um, something where we need to provide more resources. Um, and so that's another area where we see that um, in Holyoke, 40% of the students spoke in a language other than English in Holyoke. So we do have, again, um, a significant um, need there. Um, again, another piece of the data, 81% currently enrolled in the public schools are, are Latino in Holyoke. Um, they do have the lowest graduation rates at 73%. However, that has actually been an improvement. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we'll talk about the receivership later if we have time, because since 2014, there has been um, improvement, even though I'm against receiverships, but I can talk about that later. <laughs> um, so yeah, so to, on this point here is, is, is that is what I just was talking about, um, that basically um, Holyoke as a district does um, perform far below the statewide averages, like on the AMCAS, and um, the proficiency rates are much lower, and especially though in the early grades. So that's, that's a concern. In the 10th, by the 10th grade, there's actually been improvement on the MCAS, and those scores were just released um, a couple of days ago. Um, so I have to look at them, but, but this is um, still, we're expecting that, you know, there still is a lot more work to do, right, because of the early grades in terms of those outcomes. And they just changed the MCAS to make it more hard, difficult, right, to pass during the pandemic, right? So that's, that's another uh, concern. Um, and in places like Boston, um, we actually changed the graduation requirements to adopt the mass core. So there's other factors that, that also affect, right? If our schools don't, aren't teaching the subject matter that they need to graduate, um, you know, we find that, and we did a study on Miren Uriarte back in the day, we, when, when they first passed the MCAS as a high stakes test, um, we looked at what's, where, were there, what were the high schools, were they ready to teach algebra? We literally sent people out, ethnographers, into schools to see do they even have the textbooks. And no, many of the Latino majority schools did not even have college algebra. Um, and or, or the textbooks, the, the, the curriculum was just not there. And it continues to today that that is the case, especially when it comes to the mass core, that again, the schools where they don't teach you know, physical education, because there's no gym. But you have to have now PE to graduate, right, for, with, for the, because of the MK, uh, mass core standards. So those disparities continue. And we did do a study in Holyoke of the Dean Vocational Tech School and Holyoke High. It was a study done in 2016. That's why I didn't want to reference it, because it's a little old. But I think there could be some follow-up as well in looking at the individual schools, because there were some major disparities that we saw um, when we did that study by Michael Burandino in 2016 um, on doing a case study of those two high, those two high schools. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
question? Yes, please. Um, I'm interpreting data is challenging for me, so I just want to make sure I understand. Um, so that I was really surprised when you said that grades, you know, the MCAS for younger grades was showing, you know, the results were not as good as for the older kids. Are those the same kids being tested again later that that happens for? So is so there's something happening in there <laughs> that is working or? Well, no, I mean, when I, when I would present this, we would present, like, we would break it down by here's third grade, you know, here's the, the sixth grade, here's the ninth grade. So, but yes, in a way, right? Like, depending what year, right, you're capturing the data. So it could be that, yeah, the early grades, there's interventions there that then lead them, right, later in the ninth grade to have better ELA outcomes in math, right? Math and science. Science isn't given until the ninth grade. So there's also, it's hard to even compare those because they've changed the, the metrics on the test. So how are we gonna compare the MCAS results like that come out in the future when we've changed the past, the proficiency ranges. Um, so again, and, and, and the issue is not that, with, that I have with MCAS, I just wanna be clear, is I'm not against having assessments. Like we need to have diagnostic testing to know where students are. But it's the high stakes nature of it, that it's a graduation requirement. That's the problem, right? Because then not everybody Right in Massachusetts, you attend a private school, you don't have to pass the MCAS to graduate. You attend a Catholic school, you can get your, your diploma, but if you're a public school student, which will be, you're more likely to be poor, you're more like, you know, you have all these barriers, they're the ones that are, are subjected, right, to a high stakes test. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we could go into a conversation about that, but I don't know if that answers your, your question. Oh, just, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, it is, it is. But I, that's why I'm like, I, when I look at these numbers, you know, what, it, what are they really telling us, right? And, and so, you know, we have to go deeper into it, what, what's, what's going on there. Um, okay, and I will stop with the, with the charts. I just have a couple more to share. Um, so this is another issue, which is interesting, because we have data, like, from three months after graduating. Like, are they going to high school right after they graduate, or, excuse me, college? What, what is happening with Holyoke graduates? Um, so very few, right, here, this is 16 months after completing high school, 33% go on, 33 go on to higher education. That will mostly be community college. Okay, so the numbers going to four year is like horrible. Um, but this is 16 months. So there's also like, you know, there's some persistence there in some way. Like you can look at it in the positive side. But no, compared to like, again, statewide, 67% like less than, again, Latinos are not in Holyoke going to, to college um, in acceptable numbers. Um, and the issue again being that um, with these numbers, then this led to right receivership. Well, if we look at this, what districts have been under receivership? Well, guess what? Um, while there's many factors that influence educational performance, um, it does appear that the districts with the largest, that are Latino majority, like, like districts with large Latino student populations that are among the most struggling in Massachusetts. And why, why is that? Um, and so there is a troubling correlation between receivership and the Latino student population chair. And there's a lot to dig deep in there about, are you, you know, this students with disabilities, right? Be, English learners being classified as having disabilities um, when it's really uh, not, a, you know, it's a linguistic thing, it's not. So there's all these different tracking systems and ways that our Latino students are not uh, getting, you know, the education that they, they deserve. Um, and so with the, with the district turnaround plan, I believe this was renewed for another three years, but it's still the same goals, they just changed the metrics. Um, so I left them out here and I left a few of them, but um, there's gonna be different you know, ways that now you, know, you want to say whether they've met the expectations on the MCAS, 
Um, and also these are some of the primary um, ways. There's other things around family engagement and other, other issues that the, um, the receivership is, is mandating, um, but this is where, where the schools are today, still in receivership. Um, okay, so how do we then, shifting now to a more positive, assets-based approach, okay, what can we do um, to support, you know, our, our Puerto Rican and really, um, you know, all of our Latinx students? Um, you know, I was, I did get my degree in to be a social studies teacher. And, you know, back in the day, you know, we talked about this as like community cultural wealth, like this idea that like, you know, there's just like there's capital, right? Like financial capital, like that we also have social capital, right? In our communities, with our families. And so there's been a lot of work being done around how, um, some of this early work was being done on African-American students, and then um, folks like Laura Rendon and others began to like look at what are these assets of like the kind of values, right, to step that, 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 that these students bring as assets to their learning, and also are there, are there certain like distinct values and assets that Latinx uh, students have. Um, and so there's this growing kind of work that's now less deficit oriented than it used to be, like always like problems. No, let's look at what are the strengths, right, that our students are bringing um, with them into these learning environments and how, what can we do, right, to change our practices in order to support um, their, their educational success. So what the cultural wealth framework does is it presents a way of understanding like the multiple strengths and assets that communities of color possess and they use to survive, to resist, and to thrive against threats of racism and other forms of oppression. So it's naming it, it's recognizing it, it's not erasing this. Um, and I think that is also, um, you know, really important, right, work to do um, because if schools, like schools don't usually acknowledge the inherent wealth that students of color bring with them. Um, but we know that utilizing these assets can help to transform the process of schooling. So for example, when, and I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I just wanna highlight a few, like the aspirational, um, value, right, that we've observed, right, a lot of this work comes through interviews and observing students' behavior, right, and their interactions, their relationships, qualitative research, so switching from, like, the data, right, to this is, this is where it's at, like, in terms of where real um, change can happen is thinking about then if many of our students have hopes and dreams, like the migrant, right, has that, like, um, everything is like relative deprivation thesis, like, you know, things are gonna be better in this context. That that drive, right, it, it is actually something that helps these students succeed. That's why when we look at the research on recent immigrants compared to second and third generations, you see that resiliency, right, the strength in the immigrant, the recent immigrant more than you do in the second and third generations. Um, and so that aspirational capital is something that, you know, we should really be thinking about how are we supporting that? How are we nurturing that growth, right, of student aspirations, right? Um, and then also, what assumptions do we have about our students? Like, we often assume the opposite, right? They're lazy, they don't wanna learn. Horrible things that I've heard in my years of being a teacher and working in public schools that there is like these these assumptions, these negative assumptions they have because they'll look at the students too, the stereotyping, all of that is still real and, and it persists. So how do we again shift our mindset, right, to be thinking more from a strengths perspective? The same thing with like, linguistic wealth. Our students know that being bilingual in Spanish and English, it helps them 
um, communicate, it form, to, to communicate, to form relationships with others. Um, and you know, we've done a lot on code switching and like literally research on the brain, right? Cognitive development shows bilinguals are smarter. Like literally, like the research shows that. But yet we still think, you know, that there's, that's a deficit, right? That that's still being bilingual. It's like, that's why they're failing. It's that, you know, they're, they can't speak English. Um, so, but the research also finds that it depends what kind of bilingual you are. Because if, you know, we're less likely first, the research shows we're less likely to believe something if it's said with a foreign accent. Um, that's research by Lev Ariz, uh, like how accented speech is racialized and individuals become the other. Right, and so even speaking with an accent, right, today, right, it, you know, you can actually be, you know, it, it be, you can get, you know, attacked. Like it happened in Maverick Square in East Boston where, you know, two, two women, a mother and a daughter were talking in Spanish, you know, some crazy people come over and like, you know, start, you know, beating on them. So this is really, um, this issue too though, but again about the belief, right? So if I was speaking with a French accent giving my presentation, you may, Bonito. you may, que, que bonito, right? Oh Everybody God, wants to study so French. Sexy. Yes. But if I'm speaking with an accent, a Latino accent, a Spanish accent, no, you know, that's, Smart. that's not. It's a, because it's a low status language. And that's, that's a problem. It's a low status language in the United States. Right? Um, so, and popularity doesn't mean that it has high status. Just because the more people speak it, it makes it actually worse here, it seems. Um, but, you know, we would rather learn French because it is more classy. And thank you, Anna, <laughs> emphasizing that. Amen. Um, but, um, and then even the way that our students, this affects their self esteem, right? If, uh, if, our, if Puerto Ricans don't speak Spanish or if they speak it, you know, they, you know they, they're criticized, it's perceived as bad Spanish. And this even happens at the university level. Level. Like I have a colleague that when she has Spanish speaking or Latino students in the Spanish classes, there's an assumption, oh, they want to get an easy A or they're, they're in here. Like, but like there's really a lot of stereotyping and assumptions, right, that I think, you know, it's sort of, um, you know, it is discriminatory. Um, and, and so I think, you know, this idea of like speaking Spanish being discouraged not just in schools, but in society, with English only, you know, workplace environments. This also impacts the way that our identity formation happens and really our just our overall well-being. Like that self-esteem really does matter. Um, and then of course in Massachusetts, for those who remember, we had the UNS initiative in 2002, a statewide referendum, right, to, um, you know, eliminate bilingual education, but it was called the English for the Children, right? They, they repackaged that. Um, and basically, we put a lot of our students in sheltered English immersion programs. And um, that, you know, has, was really emphasizing like subtractive bilingualism, right? There was no, some dual language programming was grandfathered in, but really it's, it was about sheltered English immersion and native language or heritage language literacy was not emphasized. However, in 2017, um, the state did um, override that by passing the Look Act, um, which does give now more flexibility um, and alternative forms of delivering bilingual education. But many school districts just they stick with what they know, right? That same old put you know 12 kids over here in the basement somewhere. Um, and so this is an area that again I think needs a lot of attention, but there is possible potential there. Um, because there are school districts like in Framingham and in Brockton that have successfully done dual um, language instruction um, in their schools. Um, and again, the main point here, going back to the linguistic capital, is that language loss does hinder 
students' academic success, and it does affect their positive identity development. Um, and I've, I've, I know that firsthand. Like, my younger sister doesn't speak any Spanish. Um, I know she understands it. I get mad at her sometimes. I'm like, you can learn it, but at the same time, it's like, it shouldn't be that way. Like, it's okay. You're still Puerto Rican if you don't speak Spanish, <laughs> you know? And then there's that expectation at her job, right? Well, her former job, um, where if a customer came in that didn't speak English, they would call for her, right, to come and help. But she doesn't speak Spanish. So then it would be like, you know, like what a disgrace you are, like from the people that needed the help, like not believing, oh, you just think you're better than us. You just don't, you really know Spanish. You just don't want to speak it. This is like horrible. But again, we, we continue to reproduce those dynamics um, in our own communities, right? It's like a, like a test of your, um, you know, authenticity, right? Um, and then we do know a lot of the research of like, and this is why it's in the plan for the receivership or any student success plan, right, is that family engagement is critical. Because Puerto Ricans, you know, are, again, familismo is a major part of our culture, right? And so that familial wealth is something that we can recognize, we can help students draw upon the wisdom, the values, the stories from their home communities. Um, so how do we, you know, again, look at the way particularly mothers play, right, in, in the essential role in the education of their children? Um, and also, um, again, the, the idea that there's, there's a lot of social capital. How do we, you know, work with community-based organizations? How do we also, again, value these social networks that are very strong in our communities? Um, and that the value for education is, is very strong, right? But we think of education as not just the formal learning in the books, but it's a way of being, how you treat other people. It's like, a, it's your morality in many ways. That's what your education is, to be educated. Um, and so well, how can we affirm these things with our students? Okay, just have a few more. Um, so one of the things that I want to transition into is thinking about also the research here in, in Holyoke that, you know, basically ethnic studies can also advance academic success. I'm working in Boston since uh, 2019, actually, um, might have been a Mass Humanities funded grant, and I think it was, um, where we did a series of workshops on like kind of thinking about like Boston, you know, when you think about Boston, you think about like the Freedom Trail and like, you know, you think about basically like the revolutionary history and all that, but you don't really look at the history of the communities of color in Boston. And so we did a project where we were working with teachers in looking at particular neighborhoods, right, and their local histories, and again, the contributions of communities of color. Um, so I know just personally too, like how important it was for me to learn Latino studies, to become a Latino studies professor, and to do this work with teachers now is, is really transformative. Um, and I know that in Holyoke as well, oops, sorry, go back. Uh, one of the areas that I've been really doing a lot of the history is one is um, in Villa Victoria, which is in the South End neighborhood of Boston, and it's one of the oldest, um, you know, Puerto Rican communities. It is the oldest Puerto Rican community in Boston. Um, even the streets are named, you know, Aguadilla Street, San Juan, um, and then there's uh, the Pet Betances um, Plaza, where where we have the festivals, and so, you know, there's this like a sister city to Holyoke in many ways, but it's not a city, it's just a neighborhood of Boston. Um, but going um, to this point here, I don't know if you all caught this, and then, you know, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll break up into discussion soon, um, but I thought this was really interesting. Um, this came out in the Boston Globe magazine recently. Um, about the, the, the partnership here in doing um, ethnic studies in, in the high school. 
And the data what, what they gathered was um, from 473 uh, ninth graders. And they divided it up, like, who took ethnic studies and who did not. So everything else being the same, like, they did all these, like, multiple regression analyses and all this, this fancy data um, to really try to see what difference did that make. Um, and basically, right, the bottom line was that, um, oops, let me go back for a minute. Um, just give you the, the data here. Um, did people see this, by the way? Did you catch this in the Boston Globe magazine? Okay, I see a couple of heads nodding. Um, <clears throat> I can, again, give you the PowerPoint here that has the links to the, to the articles. Um, but basically, researchers did find that those students who participated in the ethnic studies classes, um, that there was an impact on increased graduation rates <clears throat> and decreased dropout rates among the students who took the ethnic studies classes. So, and this was even accounting for all these like margins of errors and all these other data points that they controlled for, but really finding that there was evidence of positive impact from taking those ethnic studies courses on grades, also on attendance. That was another piece. So we're talking engagement here, right? And then, you know, there's still to be determined like what the impact will be um, for years to come. I would like in the discussion if anybody knows about it, but I heard that there were cuts to this, so I don't know how that happened, so maybe we'll, yeah, there were cuts. Yeah, we had a city council hearing on ethnic studies. And a couple of city councilors were like, well, what about the Irish? What about the Italians? Can we do ethnic studies and include those groups as well? And so there was, there is this like, um, a lack of understanding of what the purpose is around, you know, again, oppression, right? Trying to also, um, you know, reframe, right, these, 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 these narratives at the core of it. But it's also about advancing social justice and, you know, even terms like decolonizing, right, the education. That, that is very scary, right, for, for, the power, for those who are in power, right? Um, so I, I'm, dis I'm not surprised. I'm disappointed, but I'm not surprised, despite that the data shows that this actually does improve. So I hope that, that people will continue to advocate for that. Um, I did want to also note then, I'm sorry, tenía pregunta. I was, so, one of the things that I, that I, was, I was asking uh, Johan, if that's the, the interim director of Palante uh, now, the one in the middle. Um, Who, Danielle Hayes? A restorative justice program within the whole of public schools that was also addressing this and trying to, to, to figure out ways how students can see themselves within, how, uh, within the school system and have representation. And so when, when this program was housed in the school, it required a commitment from the Ohio Public Schools to impact change. Because we can research all this data all we want, and, and we can know it all we want, but to what end? It's not just to know it. It has to be a motor for change, to do things in a different manner, and that's where the intimidation and the scary thing happens. Mm -hmm. Because people want to do business as usual and not make the necessary changes in order to sustain these things. So people might see that now the restorative justice program is outside of the public schools and they have their own um, building now or working out of a community-based uh, building, but that's a huge loss in public schools. Mm -hmm. oh, what a shame, really. What a shame. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna just say a few more things and then I wanna open it up for discussion. I have some questions for you too. <laughs> um, but so one of the things, I present all this data, but then one of the important things is also um, going into those, those spaces and seeing, right, what's happening with people talking about. And so we did do a study, um, at, there was a Puerto Rican, um, well, a researcher named Eileen de los Reyes, do you remember Eileen? She um, and some of our research team looked at schools that were 
Mostly Puerto Rican, because at that time, the, the, those particular schools were mostly Puerto Rican students. And they went into the schools and did ethnographic research um, to see, well, what are the success, like, how are these students, they, they picked schools that were successful. Okay? <clears throat> and they wanted to see what are those ingredients and what are like what's happening in these schools. Um, so one was that, yeah, the curriculum was exciting. <laughs> it was engaging. Um, the subjects were taught also using things like project-based, right? Or um, inquiry-based models, right? So there were also, um, you know, not just like a standardized curriculum approach. They had to have a curriculum, but it's the way, right, you know, you have your, you know, your standards to address, but it's how you develop, right, those lesson plans, it's the pedagogy that matters, right? You can teach it in different ways, right, to get to different learning styles. So that was something that came up um, where the curriculum was engaging. That is one of the characteristics, right, that can help like Puerto Rican students succeed. But then the main thing was that all these, like they interviewed teachers, they just, principals, high expectations. Mm -hmm. That's for all students, mm -hmm. right? But especially for Latino students, because even the nicest teachers, like, you know, the nice teacher that says, feel sorry for the student, right? And, and kind of lets them get away with some things. Like that's, that's low expectation right there. You think you're helping that student, right? But you actually have a low expectation. And so having high expectations and having like a critical understanding of that, mm -hmm. and I'm not talking the tough love thing either. Like that's not what I'm, cause there's that other extreme, right? Where I've had like a Latino teacher that's like went through a lot of shit, you know? And then they, they try to reproduce that, like a boot camp approach, right? Mm -hmm. Tough love, because they went through that kind of hazing almost, right? To get to where they're at. Mm -hmm. That's not, what I'm talking high expectations and care right and there's been a lot of research about Puerto Rican students dropping out because they don't fear their te they don't feel their teachers care about them mm -hmm. so care is a is a huge part and there's been a lot of research in education around care work right now Nodding's work and so forth like how important that is so having high expectations Acknowledging the obstacles that our students face, but that, again, it doesn't diminish in any way our aspirations for those students, right? And the expectation that we'll keep working as hard, as teachers, as hard as necessary to make sure those students succeed. But most teachers will just focus on the ones they think want to learn, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so that, that's a really critical part of having the high expectations. The other part was that schools, the schools that really where Puerto Rican students succeeded were also schools where the families were really involved or there was a way of relating and engaging with the families building those like blocks of supporting the success by having positive and empathetic views of the families and there was a project that I did um, in 2008 with the Chelsea Public Schools. Chelsea is a, is a city that is also Latino majority, even more than Holyoke. Um, and what some teachers, we worked it out with the union to be able to do this, that instead of having the parent-teacher conferences at the school, the teachers went to the homes. And that was incredible, the data we got. And it was only a pilot program, so we were only able to do it for a couple of years. But basically, those teachers that went to the, the homes, right, the apartments and saw, right, where, where the kids live, right, the conditions, right, the families that would welcome those teachers with meals, like, like a big meal. Like, it was incredible how the, it transformed the ways the teachers looked at and treated those kids from those points forward. And, you know, again, there's a lot, were a lot of challenges in implementing that. Teachers are busy, like, it's huge. You're gonna expect us to not go to their homes too. Like, it's crazy, but it works. So again, how do we build on, on pilots like that that we know really make a difference? Right? Yes. After the pilot was done, did they keep doing it? Is that still going on? No, no, but they but they did other things where they would have like the parent council things or the parent meetings at seven thirty in the morning. 
with breakfast. That worked. More people came to that. So rather than you have this thing after school when people are working, right, at least you do it in the morning, early morning breakfast. So there were some other interventions that happened. I, I, I'd share with you that Kelly School in Florida had a program. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah? School, but I think it got disrupted with the change in principal and COVID, which I think has disturbed a lot of programs. Yeah, that's true. I mean, so all these data, right, it's, it's worse now. Really, I know it's horrible to say, but it is, right? Um, okay, and then the other thing about the schools was, you know, this thing of also the reciprocity between the teachers and the principals and having Latino educators, right? Having other teachers, Puerto Rican teachers, that really made a difference in these schools as well. Okay, so I'm gonna now turn it to this piece now just for our discussion. Um, so I appreciate you bearing with me so long, me talking up here. Um, but really wanna um, focus now on, again, how much it makes a difference um, as well to have um, community engagement in transforming our schools. I don't know from you all or the locals how, how many Latinos actually go to these things. I don't know, but there have been a series of meetings. There's one coming up on the 12th, I think. Um, and so rezoning is huge, right? Because that's gonna really determine, right, the makeup of those schools. And so I can't imagine how contentious this, this must be for this community of, of going through a process of rezoning um, in the public schools. But I wanted to just, again, in case you didn't know, like that this is, this is going on and I hope that, that if you're here today that you have an interest, right, in, in this so that, that you can maybe participate in some of this. Um, and then, yeah, I just want to end it with um, just this, um, you know, questions for you. Maybe you have questions for me as well, but I um, wanted to just again say that my bottom line here is how important it is, right, to, you know, have asset-based approaches, right, affirming the cultural wealth for, for Puerto Rican student success, but I still think it like it works for all students um, having this approach. Um, we know that in some of the schools too that we studied that the root causes of poor educational outcomes are often seen as it's the schools how they're organized, or it's the school climate, or it's the curriculum or it's the lack of resources. Um, but as I was trying to show with that social determinants of health, right, it's like, it's, it's like, it's, a, it's, it's an ecology, it's an ecology, right? Like we have to really look at all of these, these social contexts, um, but that it's really not the deficits of Puerto Rican students. That's the problem, it is not. And the problem is that we think it's the, the students who are the problem. Um, so the challenge then is for us to maybe gain some historical, cultural, linguistic knowledge necessary to deepen the understanding of the Puerto Rican student population and to incorporate that knowledge into the curriculum and to understand again that complexity of the Puerto Rican people too, right? That there's some of us have been here three generations and some of us that are being displaced as we speak, right? And gonna be ending up in our schools, you know, tomorrow, right? And so how do we, you know, again, um, adjust for that, you know, shift our, our mindsets around this. Um, and again, I just, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to be here today because it's, it's having programs like this, right, that hopefully you'll take a seed of this and plant it and, and something will germinate and, and change. Um, and that we need, you know, again, just to really um, know where we, we came from, who we are, who our sons and daughters will be, and that we really just have much more in common um, as humans, right? And to be in solidarity with, with our Puerto Rican brothers and sisters is what I hope um, you'll take away with you today. Um, so that ends my remarks. I have some questions, so I thought maybe we could shift over to, to this piece now, just learning from you. So thank you.